The Olympics were coming to LA in 84, so when I started seeing people doing like gymnastic moves to music I'd never heard with art like this, I just, it was a cultural explosion. It was, you know, the day before that, I was riding BMX bikes, okay? And then I saw that on the news and I was like, forget that, this is, this is what I want. And the DJing, I had already been collecting records as a kid. And when I saw records being used as percussive, instruments, whew, get it. I, I, I loved percussion and I loved records. And I loved art and dancing, you know, what kid doesn't like to dance? So I did everything I could to investigate this, this whole culture. You know, I had to learn everything I could. I'm still like that. Welcome back to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super fun YouTube podcast show where me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, has a nice conversation with his super fun creative friends. Today, I got the honor to be having a conversation with a legendary turntablist, Cut Chemist. So how are you doing, my friend? Excellent. Good to be here. Woo! Good, good to see you. It's been a few years. Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, man, I, once I heard you were uh, coming down here, I got excited and... I wanted to be a part of it. Yeah, how did, how did you come in contact with this uh, gallery and the show? So Steve here at Lifted uh, Veil Gallery hit me up on Instagram mm -hmm. during the pandemic and he said, come down and see my space. And I was just kind of like, well, let me wait it out, you know, because it was like, lockdown was fresh. So I said, you know, let's wait for things to kind of see where they're going. And then, um, and then once they did, I came down and I just fell in love with the place right away. It's, yeah. you know, I don't really, I go to galleries every now and then here in LA, but it's, I don't really feel like it's, it's not like New York City, like, you know, a gallery town. So it's few and far between my gallery visits out here. But when I saw this place, I saw all this potential. And then when I heard you were coming, actually I said, is that a Chris Dyer over there? I saw one of the, the pieces and he said, yeah, yeah, Chris is going to be doing a show. And, uh, and so I was like, yeah, let's. Let's do something. Let's collaborate. Nice. Yeah. You know, I wasn't going to come to the opening of the show. Yeah, he was. He, at that point, he wasn't sure if you were going to show. Yeah, I, w I, I was scheduled to uh, perform in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And when he told me, like, oh, we got cut chemist, uh, going to go play the music at your opening. Too bad you can't come. I was like, give me one second. And I called uh, the festival. I was like, would it be a terrible thing if I canceled on you guys? You know? And oh, wow, man. I feel... I feel uh, honored. Wow, man, thanks. It, wow. I, it, it means a lot that you actually showed up, man. Because well, we, we met, what, at the Tipper shows? Yeah, 2016. 2016 at the Fillmore. At the Fillmore in Denver. Free night show. Yeah, the, the, the sleeping bag, ambient set. Oh, yeah, that was trippy. Oh, man, that was one of, uh, you know, all those Tipper shows were special. Right, like how do you like, say, like a, a Tipper show compared to your usual more hip-hop kind of crowd no and... man i mean listen you know shout out to dave veller and dave tipper um you know i didn't know what i was getting into but when they said hey we want you to play something chill and i was like okay you know what that could mean a bunch of things but then dave was like no no i mean like really like this is your playground to do whatever you want in this kind of vibe setting and i'm like how vibey are we talking about mm -hmm. he's like like sleeping bags on the floor vibe. You're like, what the and I'm like, what at the Fillmore? <laughs> no way, that's never. Okay, I'll humor you. I walked in there. Sure enough, there was thousands of kids on on the floor in sleeping bags, and so I opened up with this Bob. <laughs> This, I was like, and we got the visuals, like, this is a psychedelic experience. Right, they're all on acid. Which I'm always pining for, and you know, you don't quite get to express yourself in that vein in, in, in my normal, uh, you know, club setting in, for what I do when I get hired. Right. And so I was really excited, and, and I opened up with this Bob Reitman record. <laughs> 
And it caught on so fast with the, with the tipper crowd uh -huh. that people were like making YouTube videos of it and doing like their own thing with it. And, and so, yeah, they called me back and um, I did a few more sets, but then they had me do the Sunrise Eclipse set. Okay. Where? At uh, outside of St. Louis. Okay. Yeah, which uh, was Ast in Astro Valley. Yeah, or something yeah. like. Yeah, I can't remember the name, but it was like in totality and all that. So they wow. figured out one of the venues where totality was going to happen, and they they built a festival around ah, it. Ah, right. It was the one, two, three uh, eclipse festival. And they had me play that at like five in the morning while the sun was coming up. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are like two of the most unique shows I've ever done in my life. You know, <laughs> both. You know, thanks to Tipper and, and Dave Eller. So, yeah, yeah, and meeting you. Yeah, man. You know? Well, well great, I was so excited when I got. Well, first of all, being the one artist to live paint for Tipper at the Fillmore in Denver for free nights, I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then they told me like, oh yeah, and Cut Chemist is gonna open. It's like, what? How does right. Cut Chemist fit in this scenario? Right. Because I know you from like. I didn't even know how I fit in that scenario. Right. But, it's, it, but I, it's two different kinds of goods. I was like, well, yeah. I'm so stoked. And because it's a free night thing, it was more than like you played and then you take off. Like we got to hang out backstage. Yeah, and, man. You know, drink a couple yeah. bottles of champagne. Brought me a record to sign and yeah. then left it for Slayer to pick up. <laughs> and then I forgot it in the VIP <laughs> room. But luckily today you signed the new one. So, yeah. So I got my replacement. And. So in that whole uh, psychedelic scenario of a tipper show where like kids are all on acid on a, you know, on a sleeping bag, um, what's your psychedelic experiences? What's your medicines? Uh, are you experiencing? It's the same, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I'm the kind of guy that listens to that type of music that I was playing. So it would be like vintage rock, psychedelic rock, um, folk, you know, um, and I would listen to it at home by candlelight. Like, no shit, that's how I legit get down. Mm -hmm. And to bring that kind of sensibilities in a live setting, I don't think that I ever thought it was possible until I got hired for that gig. Like, you know, I was like, this is my own little private, you know, this is what gets my ghost. But then when Dave was like, no, you can do that. There's a crowd for that. Uh -huh. And I was like, really? Yeah, and, and he was right, there was. So uh, it was incredibly validating. You know, to know that what I really deep down like, you know, my closet fetish is, is, is like, you know, can be um, uh, enjoyed by others. Uh-huh, beautiful. <laughs> like get all interdimensional and play with people's uh, more spiritual Yeah, with side. the music and how the music, you know, moves and how it's panned. I mean, you know, because a lot of those psychedelic rock records played with stereo imaging. And, you know, they were trying to create a, a psychedelic experience to be paired with psychedelic drugs. Mm -hmm. And so when you play like a Red Crayola first album, you know, you're going to feel like you're on drugs even if you're not. Mm -hmm. you know, so imagine, yeah, if, if you're in the, in, the, in the zone and you're playing records like that, yeah, it's a good time. It's beautiful. And then I remember the first night of that show was more like the hip hop vibe. Right, hip hop classics. And I remember and I got a picture of you kind of like stepping out of the turntables and you were carrying a mixer or something and you're like almost like rocking on on it. What, what was that about? Uh, I do bring out a turntable guitar sometimes around my neck uh -huh. and play Link Ray's Rumble, okay. um, which is the famous dun, dun, dun. Um, Turntable guitar. Yeah, What's yeah, that I had about? it custom made. You made it yourself? I didn't build it, but um, I... I, it was my idea to make it, and then I brought it to a, a, a builder and a designer, Sick. and he made it happen. So basically, yeah, it's just a turntable and a guitar chassis, so I can come out and like cut it up and. I don't know if it was that, but you were rocking okay, out cool. something that Good. I was like, "What yeah. the fuck's he doing?" Are you awesome. like, are you the only one who does that, or has other people? People have caught on. I've been doing it since the early 2000s. You know, I think there's a there's a Coachella video of an early iteration of it before. It, I had a guitar chassis built, and it's just a, a portable around my neck. Mm -hmm. And um, so you could see stuff like that. Uh, no, I'm not the first. Christian Marclay did it in like 1982. Okay. Do you know Christian Marclay? No. He's a, a, an artist that you gotta check him out. You gotta check him out. He deals in multimedia, but primarily music related mm -hmm. media. So record jacket cover art. Um, he made a pillow stitched out of recording tape, stuff like this. Wow. 
He does something called a video quartet where it's random video with, with their respective audio tracks. And the randomness in the chaos finds order every so many cycles. So it's just noise, 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 noise. But then once out of every five minutes, all those sync up to a certain, like it makes music or something. Wow. Like whether it's a scream or a telephone ring and a dog barking and somebody getting shot, like that's what's going on for the whole thing. But then every now and then it just finds a flow so and then it gets out of it. Sounds kind of like uh, Dark Side of the Moon and The Wizard of Oz. For sure. <laughs> so uh, Christian Marclay is one of my biggest influences as an artist. So I didn't know he did the turntable thing, okay. but I was reading a book on New York-based artists, and lo and behold, there was a picture of him with a turntable around his neck. Oh, damn. And you're like... And uh, I was like, fuck, of course. Because uh -huh. you know? he was a pioneer or something. Yeah, ways. yeah. Beautiful. Are, are you from New York? Are you from LA? I'm Where from Hollywood, born and raised, okay. California. Nice. How mm -hmm. is it being from LA? It's, it's, it's different, you know? It, it's one of those places that I think it's a bad rap um, for its genuineness. Uh, and, right, you know, it, it gets stereotyped for being the capital of the industry, many industries, you know, uh, music industry, film industry. So that kind of puts a little bit of a, a stain on the, the, the genuine quality of, of the people. But the people that I grew up with in, in Hollywood and went to school with, I'm still friends with. Like, people I've known since 1978 in first grade to now uh, are really great people and really genuine and sweet and great artists, you know? Like, with this kind of chaotic industry capital, there's a backyard to that mm -hmm. that is such an incredible art scene. Mm -hmm. You know, we call, I guess we call it like independent artists that can't get in the door of the buildings right down the street from our house. Okay, know? so not just because you live here, you got a chance to make it in the bigger It's days. harder here because that exists. Oh, so you know, and more we're like all barriers. trying, like we're pressured to make it. Um, and, and, and so, you know, slanging demos or, or canvases and, or film reels. I've been through it all and, and it's, it's not fun. Oh, yeah? Until you figure out a way to do it on your own and make your own money and your own path, then those people come knocking on your door. When you don't need them, that's when they come knocking. Uh -huh. It's like the bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I need money. We're not going to give it to you. I don't need money. Well, we want your money. <laughs> uh -huh. you, know. you were saying like trying to slang canvases. Do you ever do visual art? I uh, went to UCLA for fine art. No way. Yep. Cool. Yep. Uh, painting, um, film, and photography. Check. Yeah. What kind of work do you do? Uh, I do something. Um, I've been doing, ever since I left college, I was given the task of, um, by a very awesome professor there, she said, well, what are two things you like? Because we were trying to find my, my thing. Like, what, what, what's your identity in, in art, you know, as a painter? And I said, I don't know. You know, I was really good at drawing things. I was a great technical skilled drawer. Like, I could render a tree perfectly. And they were like, that's, that's great, but you know, what's inside you that you're trying to get out, you know? Right, what are you trying to say? I didn't, and I didn't understand. The first time I, I was told, like, that's not art, you know? That's like a skill, it's not art. I was so pissed. Mm. I was like, fuck you, you're just jealous because I'm better than all of you. Right, yeah, that well, that's school. They want to put all these rules and tell you what you're but allowed they, to do But you know not. what? It was, it, and, and then I left that class, and this was like, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the instructor was a painter, and he was pretty famous at the time. Anyway, I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Stormed out of there, quit his class. And then another professor had the same kind of idea, but a much kinder dialogue. She was just like, hey, look, you know, maybe do some searching and take a couple of things that you love and put them together. And so she was like, well, what do you love? And I go, well, I love graffiti and I love DJing. Mm -hmm. She was like, think about how you could put those two together to create your own, um, your own statement of art and, and your own technique. Mm -hmm. And so I took records and spray paint, broke records, did a mosaic, layered it and layered it and layered it and layered it, and then I was making these canvases of these. I was like, wow, this is, this is, I like this. You know, this, they're, they're, it's a statement of hip hop. It's like two of the four elements. You know, it has to do with me. It's something that I love, and it's something that I, no one else was doing. And, um, and, and I thought the, the pictures were pretty. <laughs> yeah, sick. Well, it's gotta so, be great. I never looked back. I never drew another tree again. Uh -huh. 
So she ultimately achieved what they were trying to, but in a much better way because it was um, inviting, not antagonistic. Yeah, not you know? trying to put you in a box, but trying to explore further. Or, or tell me, like, you know, their, their, their version of it was translated for, by me as, you don't belong here. And, and hers was, you can belong here. Right. So, uh, you know, the art of communication uh, is, is, is everything. And, and that's kind of where I learned that at, at the beginning. You know, that's why I realized that. I'm sorry. Yeah, God bless the good teachers that help us uh, flower and not push yeah, us Yeah, because there's a bunch of bad ones, too. You know, hail right. to the good ones. Yeah, I had, like, teachers tell me, like, Oh, you use too many primary colors. That's a no-no. It's like, but I like primary colors. It makes me happy. And one thing I love that hip hop taught me is is breaking the rules is essential. Uh -huh. So any like I love rules. Like tell me what the boundaries are because I'm gonna jump over them. Right, and that's a, the value of going to school. Almost. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tell me what I'm supposed to do, and that's exactly what I'm not gonna do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you ever do like graffiti, graffiti? I did. Yeah. What, what was your writer name? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Maestro with a Y, M-Y-S-T-R-O, and this is like 80, 84 to 86. I think I hung up my spray cans in the city because it got, it, it started to get real hairy with gangs. Yeah. Uh, there was a place called Belmont Tunnel, which was a writer spot um, on 2nd and Lucas, <laughs> which is my name, <laughs> oddly enough. And, uh, and I'd go over there and watch the graffiti guys get down, you know, WCA, Risk, Minor. Nice. People like that. I went to school with um, K2S, Kill to Succeed. Uh, but yeah, when I started to be asked like what set I was from and you know, things were getting real, real bad and then another guy got shot and killed. I was only 13 at the time, so I was like, maybe not. You know, maybe I'll just chill for a second. And um, yeah, from, from like 86 to like 90, things kind of transitioned in a weird way for, for a hot minute to where you know, I was a little... I, f I didn't feel entirely safe. Right. And these days, you're just not feeling like trying it out for fun at any point? Uh, you, you mean today, now? Yeah, like get some cans oh, and see what you can um, throw in your backyard. My, my Honestly, my can control was never great. So, you know, even... I know the technology of nibs is better now, you know, but... Uh, but I'm, I'm good with the canvases and doing the record art thing. Mm -hmm. You then appear of your covers? Uh, uh, yeah, I did a whole series of die cut covers that were blank sleeves and I hand did them. I think I did probably like 25 oh, nice. and I sold them at a premium. Like each show I did on that tour was also a gallery show oh, wow. with the covers and, and they were for sale. Sick. Um, and yeah, that was a lot of fun. That went from LA to London, you know. Amazing. I didn't know you were such a fine artist. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't, it's, yeah, I'm trying to make that statement bolder now because um you know with touring less trying to exploit the other avenues that i have to offer right so yeah i am nice <laughs> <laughs> by his art <laughs> um and wait. you can find it on the you can well all those sold out but every now and then i'll throw up a custom art cover um but and people can find that on you your can Instagram find it on or? on instagram or uh, ban my band camp Okay, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or my website. So you stopped doing graffiti when you said you were, you were 14. When did you start? In, when did you find hip hop? When did you start? Well, uh, 11, 11 in 83. Okay. Yeah. You know, How do you find it? It found us, you know, breakdancing crossed over to the mainstream to the point where you were like, what, what, what is all this? In LA, the Olympics were coming to LA in 84. So when I started seeing people doing like gymnastic moves, to music I'd never heard with art like this. I just, it was a cultural explosion. It was, you know, the day before that, I was riding BMX bikes. Uh-huh, sick. Okay, and then I saw that on the news and I was like, forget that. I, this, is, this is what I want. Uh -huh. And the DJing, I had already been collecting records as a kid. And um, when I saw records being used as percussive instruments, whew, Get it. I, I, I loved percussion and I loved records and I loved art and dancing, you know, what kid doesn't like to dance? So I did everything I could to investigate this, this whole culture. I mean, I became um, a, a, you know, a nerd about it. You know, I had to learn everything I could. I'm still like that. 
Yeah, well, that's beautiful. Yeah, so I, when I traveled uh, to New York for the first time in 86, I had this long list of records and I wanted to learn so much, listen to the radio, listen to Red Alert Show and stay in the hotel and just record everything and take it all in, go to the record shops, try to meet people. Man, those were the days. Nice. So yeah. you must have like a sick record collection. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> it's big. But, you know, it's, I'm now at the point where, you know, I sell also vintage vinyl on my sites because, you know, I have so many records that I got to start kind of sharing that stuff with the people. It takes a lot of space. I, it takes a lot of space. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what am I going to do with four copies of this or that so yeah it's and now with serato to... you could do the same yeah i mean you know i don't get me wrong i'm still a collector and an archivist but you know i don't need like five sealed copies of this record i can sell four of them mm -hmm. yeah. well, that's good yeah so when did it go from like a hobby and a passion into like oh shit i i could like make a living from this and or when i was like... 15 okay. my uh let's see i was DJing, where was I? I was DJing at this place called the Silver Lake Park Recreation Centers, which is where I met the J5, so Charlie Tuna. It's where I met Charlie Tuna. And somehow getting connected with his circle of friends, they asked me to start DJing their house parties. And me being 15, I didn't have a license, so my mom would drive me <laughs> to, yeah. to the gigs and I would play records. And I remember getting paid and I didn't expect it. Tech. They were just like, hey, you came here, you DJed. Here's like, I don't know, it was like 50 or 75 bucks. That's good. And for I walk kid. in and mom picks me up and I'm just like, yeah, Molly. She was like, what, what's this? Uh -huh. You're are you getting paid? Are you selling drugs? <laughs> <laughs> no, she knew what, what time it was. So um, I was like, oh, wow, I can actually get paid for something I like to do. Mm -hmm. One thing led to another. And then by high school, like the, I think like the last year of high school, we started to throw our own parties. Okay. And, uh, and, and then after that, and then, and then, then, you know. Beautiful. Yeah. So you were like, okay, I can like, you know, pursue this further and. I didn't expect, I thought I would go into college for art and be like a production designer for the movies because I love movies and I loved art. But when I found hip hop and DJing and learned that I can make money off that, you know, I thought it was just gonna be a hobby, but it turned out to be my career. And then the art became a hobby. And now, you know, so it kind of goes back and forth now to where they're both hobbies and they're both work. I try not to put too much stress on one because I'll get burnt out on it and maybe leave it alone forever. Like, I got burnt out on art after school that I never really did painting or drawing after that for many, many years. And I just stuck with the music. But um, I, uh, I, eventually got back to it because I started to get burned out on the hip-hop because when you are in the industry and they cart you around like a circus monkey you know it's for years and years and years you, you there's nothing to love about it right after that Six process months. yeah and you're doing things because they want you to and you can't rest and you get pneumonia twice and it's just bad news bears so um, when I had a long time to kind of rest I started to pick up the paintbrush again and the spray can and mm -hmm. the pencil. And Variety is mixed yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. And then also like, you know, using the same things that I learned in art school to do stuff like designing covers for my own products, you know. So using the sensibilities, maybe not physically being the um, uh, Photoshop guy, but saying, hey, take this image, put that there, do art this. Directing. Art directing, thank you. Yeah, uh, so I never really left it alone. I just, you know, didn't really do the, the, the actual painting and drawing for a while. But I'm back. Sick. Well, good, good job for you. So in that whole process of trying to get into the world of, of music, like you, you were in the band called Also Matley, right? Which, yep. Was that hip hop or Latin funk or like? It's all and none. Okay. So, so okay. So let me see. What's the story here? Will Dog, who's the bass player, who's the band leader. He's the one that formed the band. Charlie and Mark Seven from J5 and I had a group that we were performing with and we were using live musicians. A bass player and a drummer. Will Dog was that bass player. This is long before Oza Motley. And so we were doing that for a couple summers, live band hip hop. 
Mm -hmm. And then Will Dog went away for a while. He came back. I haven't heard from him in a, in a few years. He comes back and he's like, I got this crazy idea. Okay, what is it? It's a band. It's, it's a Latin band. Like, a, you know, we want to do salsa. We want to do music from kind of all over the world. We have a tabla player, so there's, you know, Indian elements. Uh, and we want a DJ. And I, was, and, and, uh, I said, this sounds a little experimental. I'm totally fucking down. Yeah. You know, I, like, I don't know what to describe this as. That's why I like it. Uh -huh. And so we practiced and did our first gig at this breakdance competition night called Radiotron, which has its own cool lineage. Like, if you see the movie Breakin', it's the, the club is Radiotron. Uh -huh. Anyway, they, <laughs> it was their anniversary, and that was like our first gig. So we were rooted in hip hop. Like it was, we were from the street. We embraced hip hop culture, but you know, it was music that was from all over the world. I mean, we ended up doing cumbias. We ended up doing West African rhythms. You know, Brazilian was was yeah. huge. And then you add the DJ elements, where I'm cutting up breaks, and they're playing like horn lines from all these different cultures around it you know yes funk yes rock but yes and it was kind of like associated with like the you know punk rock culture i think it was like in vans warp tour kind of so yeah absolutely you know uh the two bands that i was in i think went went to vans warp tour and i think both bands were head scratchers for their lineup uh, Oza Motley was one of them, and then Jurassic 5 was the other. Like, we both did the Vans Warp Tour, and I don't think, I think J5 was the first rap crew to be at Warp, at Warp Tour, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so did Oza Motley, like, become, like, a popular band? It did. Yeah? yeah. How, how big they become? Well, they won a Grammy. Oh, yeah, of course, after I left, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, but but you know we spent the first maybe four years doing cir club circuits in LA mm -hmm. and then you know moved up and down the coast and then next thing you know we're driving to Colorado doing shows Texas and stuff like that and then the Warp Tour was the first kind of nationwide thing and then from there it just took off but yeah it was you know we had a major deal a uh, major label deal and um, you know, made videos and did the whole industry you know, thing. And yeah, they, they got a Grammy for their second album. Right. So now they're known as Grammy Award winning Ozumali. Nice. And they still alive or are they? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They're still doing shows. I think they're doing a show today in San Diego. That's sick. Yeah. Amazing. So was that your first band that kind of like made it and you said you were both in that one and Jurassic 5? Yeah, so Ozo Mali and Jurassic 5 kind of popped off at the same time. Oh wow. Yeah. How was it being in two bands? Did you it have to do two different oh, tours? Man, I was going to school full time. I was in both bands and doing my own shows all at the same time. I don't know how I did it. I guess, you know, being in your 20s just gives you the juice. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was, it was tough to maintain. Like, I had to make compromises all around. But uh, it, it worked. And then, let's see, J5 started in 94. Ozo started in 95. Oh, wow. And J5 got signed as, to sing. Uh, I mean, there's so many little details. It's pretty much irrelevant. But yeah. When did it blow up? Which one? Both? Like, uh, well, Jurassic. Ozo Motley blew up when I think they did... I think when, you know, the videos started, when, like, when the album came out and the videos were banging and the, and the singles were going, coming out, that's, I noticed, you know, an uptick quite a bit in, in, in the attention the band was getting. And it was, I thought it was a hard band to market because it was very unique. But Almo, which was Herb Albert's label with Jerry Moss, the, you know, A&M <laughs> lineage uh, for all those record head uh, history people, um, it was their label, so they did have some know-how in the Latin markets and stuff like that and how to cross it over into the mainstream. But um, yeah, I thought they did a great job. And, and the producer we used was T-Ray, who was a hip-hop uh, royalty. You know, he did things like Cypress Hill and remixes, but he also had a foot in the rock world. Mm -hmm. So he was the perfect guy. And then the, the, the mixing engineer was this guy, Anton, who did all my favorite hip hop albums. When I walked in, I had an organized confusion sticker on my turntable. He was like, I mix that record. I'm mm -hmm. like, bullshit. You know, like, you're lying. How, how, that's just so random. Right. You know, here in LA, you, no way. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> he was like, no, and I played keys on Fudge Pudge, and I played bass on Snake Eyes by Main Source, and I played sax on uh, Streets in New York by Cool G Rap, and I'm just like, Damn. Okay, so basically you made all my favorite rap records and you're, you're helping us make this record? Uh-huh. Okay. And which one, which, which record was this that? This was Ozamali's first album. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So that was uh, a huge honor. And then, and then J5 didn't get their major Interscope deal until... Late 90s? 99. Yeah. 99. Quality Control? Came out in 2000. Okay. So. Yeah, we put out an EP on our own, but then they picked it up as kind of like a... A, a warm up to the big full length, mm -hmm. and that didn't. That lasted from 2000 to 2006. Was feedback. I did the quality control and power numbers. Feedback I, I was not on. Uh -huh. So yeah, that, that seemed like it got even bigger than also Matley. At least in my perception, maybe because I pay more attention yeah, to I, hip hop. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, J5 didn't win a Grammy. <laughs> yeah, but, but like, you know, what about this? You know, for me, like it, people on the streets or it's it's. it's it's different, you know, they have their different respective crowds, but there is a Venn diagram mm -hmm. of the two, and, uh, and, and those are fun. We've done collaborative Ozo Motley J5 shows that, oh. are, that are completely bananas. You, you're exhausted, just like, oh, uh, Yeah, right, I get to work double time. But no, and I spin a Latin set before, and oh, you know, it's, I get to wear all the different personalities. That's you know? fun, that's variety. Because I have such yeah. a split personality in music taste, and, and this way I get to do it all, but yeah, we, those shows were so much fun because those crowds, it brings in such a dynamic, rich demographic from, uh -huh. both, from both groups. So right. I want to do that again. I would love to do a J5 Ozo Motley huge blowout tour because, you know, they, they both share Charlie, Tuna, and I, oh, and yeah, myself. Oh, so, yeah, right. Anyway, that's, yeah. that's beautiful, man. And somewhere where I remember seeing you a lot was in that documentary, Scratch. Uh, Scratch was, yeah, Brad Blonheim, he spent a, a while interviewing everybody. I can't remember at what point he interviewed me, but it was after, it, the, or I mean, what, at what point in the process um, of his filming that he did it. But he, he, I remember him filming me the night, the day after the Brain Freeze show with Shadow mm -hmm. at the El Rey, which they also filmed, but we had to cut it out because... 7-Eleven was on our back about copyright issues. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I'm like completely dusted, still, still wearing my 7-Eleven shirt <laughs> from the show. <laughs> That's why they couldn't use the footage because you had a t-shirt? No, no, because Brain Freeze was all like the centerpiece of it was all 7-Eleven based. Oh. It was like the logo, the colors, the music, like we oh, use so a 7-Eleven 45. It was you and DJ Shot. Yeah, and we use all 45s and, and this was uh, in 2000 in January, January 2000. And anyway, so yeah, he shot my interview. I was like, does it have to be tomorrow? Because, <laughs> you know, I helped put on that show, curate it. You know, and, and so it, it, there was a lot more going into it for me than just performing. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, it, that, that Scratch documentary is awesome. And it gets a lot of mention. It really depicts the DJ culture in, in all its different facets pretty well, from right. record digging, musical taste, to skill set, to abstract, you know, performers. Um, yeah, he, they did a great job of telling that story. Yeah, I super love it. And I, I love that I can still find it in used uh, DVD stores and buy it for my friends. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was like a section of like uh, competitions. Were you in the whole competition? No, 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 no. I, I did. I got out of that competition like after my first competition. <laughs> I battled at, at 12, year, 12 years old at Radiotron, the aforementioned club that Ozo Motley played at for their anniversary. But this is 1984 when it was at the location in Breakin', the movie Breakin'. Uh -huh. I entered a DJ battle and I lost to the point where I had to like walk out of there with my, you know, he head down and like trying to hide because it, it was bad. But I was 12, you yeah. know, and, and white, which back then there weren't any white 12 year old DJs. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, at least entering battles and so it, it was one of those things where I walk in and everybody's like 10 feet tall right just looking like they're the baddest motherfuckers on the planet and very intimidating and I'm just like do you mind if I share the oxygen with you guys okay. with you gentlemen for so five minutes how is it being like a white dude in the world of hip-hop <laughs> back then I mean you know it's different now but I mean you know back then it was uh, 
you know, it, it wasn't really nothing. It was just, um, I don't, no matter what color or race or gender or whatever you are, you're always going to get tested. You know, when you're an outsider and you're walking in, it, it's same with high school, same. And so every step of the way, I, you know, that happened. You know, no matter how I looked or what the color was or whatever. And I embraced it. You know, at a certain point, I was just like, this again, oh, cool, I'm down. Because remember, like we were talking about before, the rules have to be broken. If you want to create something that it will be memorable, you have to break rules. So when I walk into a place and get tested, I'm like, all right, what are the rules here? You know, when I get accepted, like, what are the rules? All right, yeah, fuck. You're, How can I make some magic? We're gonna, we're gonna have a tough time, but you're gonna love me after we get past this little rough patch right. of rule breaking, which I'm going to do. Did you piss <laughs> off some people by doing that? Oh, absolutely. And not, you know, it was all peace and respect. I wasn't like, okay, yeah. you see this rule you just gave me? Fuck. You know, no, it was just like, okay, cool, man. I love. This Let me place. do my own interpretation. I love what y'all do. I just do it a little differently, and it takes a while for them to warm up to it. Some people won't warm up to it, and, um, and you build a, a little crew within that larger crew, and that's who you roll with. And, and, and you know, that's, that's pretty much the good life or, uh, you know, like I said, high school, junior high. I mean, I got my ass kicked in junior high for biting pieces from other graffiti artists. I went down to Pan Pacific in 84 and looked at crime, prime styly, you know, all the old school OGs and bit the hell out of their pieces. And then I would bring them in like, you know, when you'd have a crush on a girl and you do her piece, uh -huh. those pieces would get to the, those dudes oh, and they'd no. be like, oh, who did this? Oh, dude, that new cat. Uh -huh. And so I'd get hassled for being a biter. Uh, you know? Well, we all got to start somewhere. Yeah, man. Right? I was, you know, and I didn't think they knew because I was like, oh, this is probably a place that they wouldn't know so I could bite the pieces. Yeah. It's not like I'm biting subway art, you know. Yeah, and making like money off of it or and something. And they knew exactly. They were like, yeah, we do pieces there too, dude. Oh, man. <laughs> but anyway. Um, the importance of being original. Yeah, yeah, you, you have to copy. I mean, I had to learn um, by copying. At the beginning, right? Yeah, oh. you know, like I call it training wheels. Right. You know. Totally. And, um, and, and but by the, by the end of that year, I remember they started to be nice. And they were showing me, how, they were actually tell, helping me how to make my pieces better. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, you know, that's really cool. Like you were picking on me the whole year, but the last semester, the, the, I remember spe specifically what it was. I used to make a capital letter and then short letters. And they were like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to help you out make them all the same mm -hmm. so it's like flush mm -hmm. and I, it just never dawned on me to do that i just figured you know a capital letter and then small like words. a like a normal like word. yeah and so i was doing my graffiti that way and they were like yeah that's a little messy like try it like this check it out boom, 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 boom. and i was like yeah it does look great thanks they're like no problem and these are who like your teachers or your people no these are like the other students okay yeah um in high school or yeah yeah one of them was david arquette the actor Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah, he tagged he some... Was, he was a tagger? He was a graffiti artist. <laughs> a good one. Wow. Yeah, his, 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 he had skills, but he was also a b-boy, uh, and I battled him, too. He kicked... He, he served me, but... Um, <laughs> I'm serious, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Oh, he, man, uh, things that could happen in LA, huh? Yeah, man. Uh, but yeah, his, his, his pen style was dope. They, they, their walls were great too. And, um, and so anyway, that's, that's who uh, I went to school with, people like that. And that, that, they, gave me, they, they gave me a lot of um, knowledge, you know, about a lot of stuff, break dancing and, and, and just hip hop in general. Mm -hmm. You know, what music, where to find it, you know, like those kids. They had their ear to the street more than I did because they were a year older and, and, and they have been, you know, going and bombing the walls and stuff. So they were living it tougher than I was. I was just at home watching it on TV. This was my first time kind of really seeing people in the field doing it. So, yeah, much respect to those guys. Awesome. So you were in these big uh, groups or bands, and, but you also done collaborations with other, uh, you know, uh, turntablist producers, yep. uh, DJ Shadow and Madlib. Uh, who you like to work with? Who do you respect? Who inspires you? Like, you know, who, mm -hmm. you know, who you like to work with other than your groups or whatever? Well, DJ Shadow is always a pleasure. 
to work with. Um, he, his work ethic is, is, is insane. And to be in that world that's very, I mean, it's just like everything is practiced to the T because most of the time it's for a tour that's going to go around the world. You know, and we're not fucking around. It's like, it's major league shit. So that, that, you know, I don't really get that outside of those collaborations with him. Like, I don't get that, uh, I don't get to experience that outside of him in his what, world. What, like a level of professionalism? Yeah, or? I think so. I think that's just, it's that simple. It's just that professionalism. What, what do you, what do you mean exactly? Like, is it like a clean presentation or just some technique advancement? That it's everything might... from the way he tells a story or the way he arranges a story to be told to what's going to accompany, accompany it to drive the point home with the audience. You know, how are you going to tell this story and how is it going to have impact that people will remember for their whole lives? I think he's kind of the best at that. Uh -huh. You know, whereas I think before I was doing those shows with him, I looked at a show as just a show that's happening and then it's over. Mm -hmm. So I didn't look at it as something that would leave a legacy or something that would even be recorded. You know, I do it, it's done, next. No, he was, he's like, he looks at it differently. Like this show is life. You know, this like it. It, this is it, it's never going to end. It's always going to exist and people can always refer to it. And just that approach to doing art uh, is, is, it was something I wasn't used to. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, because you look at it differently and you take it, um, you, just, you just take it in differently. You, you, the thinking about what you do, and you know, sometimes you could psych yourself out doing that. So there's a balance to like improv and script. How do you balance between Clean, the script? Clean but loose at the same time. Right, yeah, loose and, and but at the same time tight. Mm -hmm. And I think when Shadow and I get together, that balance is created somehow. Are you, what, what would you say you're more like tight or loose or also I'm mixed? the loose one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he tightens me up and I think I loosen him up to where, you know, like with the script, because there's always something that's going to go wrong that'll throw you off the script. And the more you practice improv, the more that that's not going to phase you. And I think that's important. Right. There was one time when a turntable just flat out died in the middle of our set. Like, I mean, for unexplained reasons, the motor just, it stopped. Wow. And so this was in Japan. And I, I was like, don't worry, because it's still being amplified with the needle. It's right. just the motor. So I just started spinning it with my finger uh -huh. live and calling the, 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 road, the, the stage people over to swap it out as I'm doing it. Uh -huh. So like a pit crew, they come <laughs> as I'm <laughs> doing it and they're lifting it you know, away <laughs> and replacing it with another one. Wow, and, a uh, quick switch of the plug. Or the, yeah, 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 like yeah. The, and, and the show must go on, the show must go on. And I remember jo <laughs> Shadow was like, as he was doing his part of the routine, he, he was like, wow, I can't believe this dude actually Pulled it off. Yeah, pulled it off and wasn't phased by it. Uh -huh. So much that he stopped the show and made an announcement. Like, he's like, I just, I, yeah, he's like, I just got to say something. You know, <laughs> my man cut over here. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was, uh, that's <laughs> that's awesome, that was fun. Man. Wow, that's so great. Being in Japan performing with DJ Chow, what a yeah. dream. And having your turntable die in the middle of the set. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm opening up for Shakira at, uh, for hockey stadiums in Europe for three months, you know. When, when was that? Uh, 2007. Wow. And opening up for Shakira. Yeah, it's just her and me. There's no, like, I, I'm not like the warm-up DJ for another act. It's like every full house, they're like, okay, go. That's such a weird mix, once again, like... How, I, how did you get picked to open up for such a mainstream? I, I have no idea. Pop. I think, I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea, man. Yeah, but uh, a turntable died on me in the middle of that set. Uh -oh. And at that point, you know, it's like Serato, so it's computer based, which is almost kind of worse because in 2006, if software glitches, if vinyl glitches, I'm cool. Like, I can get around that. But when software glitches, I'm a deer in the headlights. I don't know what to do. Right. I mean, isn't the computer crashes, you're done. Yeah. I can't remember how I got out of that, but I did. Like, I made some shit Started happen. Started singing. <laughs> yeah, right, or telling jokes, I don't know. But we're talking like 30,000 folks at each show. The wow. first one I did, though, I got booed by everybody. <gasps> 30,000 people, 
in Germany, in Hamburg. They were like expecting a Shakira style music and you just come out doing I some... come out beat juggling like breaks and they're like, no. <laughs> wow. I almost got fired, man. How, how does that feel? To it felt, it, it was so bleeding? crushing. Damn. It was so crushing, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because... Um, you had to be like, how do I get in this? How vibe? do I make this work for them? Because they're right. You know, I'm, it, I, I was fresh on my album campaign, so I'm like trying to promote my stuff. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was I was trying to do all this noodly like beach juggle stuff that only, a, you know, can be appreciated by maybe these people or these people or, or another possibility is that I just wasn't doing it good enough for them to like it. Probably the latter. Anyway, so I had to figure out, you know, they were like calling me into the office and I knew I was going to get fired. And so I was like, let me make this work. So I had to come up with a playlist that they would recognize. So when I do my beat juggling, they know how it's being manipulated. Right. So exactly. they can appreciate it. So like, if I, oh, say, I know that song, if I it's say, on the radio. Yeah, if I take Blur song number two uh -huh. and I beat juggle it, which is what I ended up doing. Right. So what are the like arena rock songs? Well, you know, there's like song number two. There's Bucky Dunn Gun by MIA at the time was hot. Welcome to Jam Rock. Right. You know, like things that don't stray too far away from my world. They're still cool, but they're mainstream. But they're recognizable. And even if they aren't, they recognize it as something that they should know. Right. You know, oh, what was the other one? Um, I mean, I tried everything like Hung Up by Madonna. I tried, you know, like I went through like it took about maybe seven shows to dial it in. Uh -huh. But I finally did. And I get to I got to keep the record, the songs off my album that I was promoting in the set because one was Brazilian, the other one was like kind of big rock, you know, like heavy beats. Um, so those, those weren't a problem. Uh -huh. and, uh, and by the end of the tour, I was getting uh, unanimous cheers. Sad. So, I mean, I turned it around nice. and I remember that was like a, a life lesson for me. After, it was a rite of passage. Beautiful, man. You know? Rocks. Yeah. Who else have you performed that you're like proud and stoked or a nice uh, memory? J5, I, you know, Jurassic 5. I mean, outside of my friend circle, I know that. But I got to say, you know, performing with, with Jurassic 5 is so fun and creative. And, you know, everybody is just loves the hip hop culture. Seems like a really good vibe. Yeah. Hip hop culture from as a historical sense and in the present and kind of the lineage of how to do shows. You know, we're students of people like De La Soul, Cool Crush Brothers, Run DMC, you know, and so we're taking that ethic of live performance and, and continuing on with it with things like turntable guitars and, you know, inventive little custom gadgetry. Right, your own spin on the yeah, old we, school vibes. Yeah, and, and, you know, we do a lot, we did a lot of alternative uh, shows, like we opened up for Fiona Apple on her tour you know, like, how did, that's almost as weird as me and Shakira. Not quite, but it's pretty weird. Yeah. But that was, that was a great tour. That's, that's, she was pretty huge. So you've traveled the whole world uh, mm -hmm. doing shows. Yeah. What's like a tour or a trip that you're like, that was sick. Like, I say if I played there. Uh, well, okay, so in Colombia. I went to Colombia, uh, uh, I think it was like three or four years. After COVID, I can't judge time. Like it, it, maybe it's 10 years ago, maybe it was yesterday, I don't know. But it was uh, the, the only time I've ever been to Colombia. And my, my girlfriend and I went there for about a week. Mm -hmm. And so we went to this festival called Petronio Alvarez in, in Cali. Mm -hmm. I didn't play. I just went there. You know, we went there to watch, uh, see the music and hear the music. It was such a spiritual, amazing experience. Like, um, I can't even and describe it, but if anybody gets a chance, it's in August. Incredible festival. Anyway. So the, the tour you're remembering is one that you're not even... No, no, no. <laughs> Hold on. No, was, it's a show. But I did play the after party at the small club in, in, in Cali. Oh, okay, cool. With Quantic. I don't know if you know Quantic. Yeah, yeah. And he used to live in Cali, so, you know, it was, uh, but he, he moved since then. So him and my friend Brian Cross, who's a, a famous photographer for all kinds of stuff, really, and filmmaker. Uh, so we're there DJing, and it's like four in the morning, and we're just, I mean, Quantic hits him with, like, some crazy shit, man. And, and I just, like, sat back in this foreign country that I'd never been to, and I love the music so much here. 
and listening to one of my heroes, you know, I love Quantic stuff, play at four in the morning and everybody's digging it, the locals are loving it, and it was just a good time, man. I, I guess, you know, my answer is that just had an impact because of the music that he played seemed so out of the box, but the vibe was so great after that festival that people were down for anything. Mm -hmm. so. And, um, and it was, there was a certain spiritual uh, quality to it that it wasn't like heavy beats or, you know, anything like that. It was just the spirit of music and where it takes you. Mm -hmm. and any kind of music that does that is is welcome and he played some like kalimba based african thing that had no beat it was like very woody very organic rich but deep Fuck. i've never been to colombia i've always oh wanted man to and he's dropping that at four in the morning and everybody's loving it in this small tightly packed wow oh, man. i mean i i changed i was never the same yeah that. never the same that's so sick but you talk about other people like kid koala is one of my favorite djs he lives in Montreal, huh? I know. He's, he's a good friend of mine. When I saw him perform in 97, it blew my mind. And it also was like, oh, you can do that. Mm -hmm. He was the first DJ I saw break the line and come out from the set. You know, I was like, this is the set. You don't, you don't move. You do your shit. That's it. He walked out from behind the set and started throwing M&Ms to the crowd and it, it was just that simple thing mm -hmm. it, it's not like you it's know, very friendly it, but it also made it it was interactive right it was the first time i saw interactive behavior from a dj right in, in montreal he does this thing called uh, music to draw for yeah, where like course. it'll be a small cafe yeah. and you'll be in the middle playing records and eric is around just doing their art yeah he does it on patreon now oh yeah 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 cool uh, because of covid right. so He's always done the most inventive shit. He writes books about a robot who falls in love. He does a show based on the book about a robot that falls in love in his book. Right. And it's all like he custom makes the miniature figures and yeah. does this whole show of a live animation. And maybe, forget it. I mean, Very the dude's a, is such a genius and, uh, and a sweetheart. So. He's one of my biggest influences. Oh, wow. You know, Shadow's one of my biggest influences, you know. Uh, Quantic. What about Madlib? I love Madlib myself. I mean, man, I spent, uh, what, two weeks in Brazil with Madlib? I, I was his roommate. Oh, wow. In 2002. And How was that experience? Oh, it was completely psychedelic. It was, <laughs> it was incredible. It was incredible. Uh, again, B Plus, who shot this Brazilian time, uh, movie invited us, us all down for a Red Bull. It was like Egon, the Beat Junkies, Mad Lib, me. We bought records every day and we, we had a great time. And then we played, we had gigs. Like we would do gigs, go to Samba schools because they were getting ready for carnival, buy records and eat great food wow. and give lectures to people for the Red Bull Academy. I mean, that's what we did. So sick. It was, yeah, yeah, Mad Lib's fucking dope, man. Um, I, I've known him for a long time, but I don't really know that much about him because, you know, he's kind of quiet. Okay. <laughs> Even as a roommate, I'm like, hey, you, you're alive in there, you know? And he's on his little cassette beat maker thing with his headphones on, going through all the records he just bought, making beats, which I think and some ended up on the Mad Villain record later. Okay, sick. Wow. Um, I love that one. But yeah, yeah, he's, he's great. So how has it been this year with COVID? Because, you know, musical performers, like artists can stay home and do art and sell their art online. Or, yeah. you know, how is it for a musician that's used to touring? Yeah. What do you do? Uh, how's it been for you? That's I think that's where I, I, I really started to want to make art. Because, uh, yeah, most of my income comes from doing shows. Mm -hmm. Very little of it is online hustle. All that completely 180, you know, during COVID. So uh, no shows. I f had to figure out a way to have a presence online that would sell product to pay the bills. You know, it was simple. And at the first day, you know, I did everything from doing candlelight sets on Instagram Live. You know, this is pr before everybody moved over to Twitch. And just tried to be kind of a person going, hey, you know, I want to offer something that 
is either like teaching or lecturing about stuff I love or, you know, let's calm down and listen to music by candlelight. Yeah, some kind of service. Kind to of. Help the, with the healing. And to help me. Like, it's a service for me, too, because talking about hip-hop history and burning candles and listening to psychedelic records is, is helping me through this. Right. So I wanted to offer that uh, to my audience. And it was cool, but then the dialogue, like, I don't know, once Floyd happened, the social narrative kind of got, it just went in a different direction. So, um, uh, yeah, I just um, kind of retreated and, and tried to figure out what it is I wanted to say and add to the narrative without, I was, I, I was confused, you know, because right. everything could be taken the wrong way. Right. Um, it was you know, tricky times for sure. Yeah, and so when your voice is online, it's there forever, and so you gotta kind of yeah. figure it out how you wanna how you wanna. Are you yourself. like nervous of getting canceled by making a mistake? Well, I mean, you know, uh, I'm just sometimes you know uh, before I can form a complete sentence and thought, I, I have to think about it. Right. Well, that's you know? the smart thing to do. Yeah, and so sometimes, <laughs> so anyway, that's what I was doing. I was like, all right, let me kind of figure it out. And then what I started to do was taking it offline and acting locally. So I started to do deliveries for people okay. and um, selling music to people and delivering it to them. Wow. I was baking pies and delivering it to them. What? Yeah. No way. So it was this kind of like, you know, where things online got a little weird because also the politics are, were and are weird the divisiveness of everything. I just didn't feel like I had a voice that, it was always gonna be challenged and there was always gonna be some fighting to get through all the noise and stuff. So I wanted to get off of that and just go back to hanging out and doing things for people in person, face to face. Right, that's beautiful, man. And, uh, I and would it, love to get a pie delivered by Cut Kenny. Dude, my, 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 my grandmother's apple pie recipe bangs. It bangs. And so I was like, fuck it, you know, it's the holidays and I, I, I miss seeing people. Yeah, that's You know, good. and so I want to go out and so I did, did this thing. I was like, what do you think? Should we do? <laughs> and uh, so I think, yeah, it was like, I'll drive to you and bring you a, a fresh baked apple pie. <laughs> nice, and you were like announcing that on your Insta or something? Yeah. That's great, man. That's good, I'm very And it was hard because, you know, you're awesome. like, I can make one, maybe two pies for a holiday. Mm -hmm. But when you get like five or six orders, you're like, fuck, you know? <laughs> like, this is kind of tough. That's this, funny. this is difficult. It's like, I don't know if I want to become a baker now. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> no, then it's like, well, then you got to open up a place and get a kitchen and get workers. Uh, the overhead's too much. But uh, I was thinking of collaborating pies and records. But oh, yeah. we'll see, we'll see. It's or next what, season. What about a pie that looks like a record? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, or a record what, that looks like a pie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what about um, a stable, uh, a stable, stable sound? sound. Is, is that like a, a podcast? Or, it's my label. It's my boutique record label, mm -hmm. uh, which I've had since 2004. And um, it's when I was signed to Warner Brothers, uh, which is a major label, obviously, there were many rules like sam you had to clear your samples. It had to be legal. You couldn't just have free reign as an artist. So I created a stable sound as kind of an independent label to not adhere by those rules away from my major product. So if I wanted to like cut loose and just whatever, uh, do a mega mix, I could put it out on a stable sound. And that turned into a website and you know, I still put out records and music and you know, I have my own Instagram for it. But there was like a podcast, right? I remember oh, you had Oh, there like was, a song yeah, a stable sound. It, it had, it turned into a radio show. Right, because it was like a video, I remember on the first episode, I think I might have caught it on, on Insta or something, and you had the Gaslam Killer show up in Maryland and all the other people. Yeah, the, the, the Maiden Voyage show was my birthday show. And uh -huh. so it, it was like 50 people in there, and everybody showed up. It was crazy. Up. Oh, man, it was crazy. And it was it, a it, four it, and a half hour long and show. And everybody was playing records. Yeah, I was man. like, this is so sick. I know, I listened to that because that was one of the greatest nights of my life. So Having, that was on Insta? That was, what's that? Was that on Instagram Live? No, 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 no. This was just on the radio. This was um, not filmed. It was just an aired radio show on dublab.com. Okay. And so we got them to 
So you know, there's no it, value aspect of it? Oh, yeah, there is. There's some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my assistant was really good at, at the filming. Right, because I caught that. I saw like you know you oh. guys sitting and playing. Oh and I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, can't remember where I caught it. Yeah, I we like, didn't, it, we didn't air it live on film, but we aired it live on just on audio. Uh -huh. But yeah, fools were filming. I mean, we had Mike and Nine up there. We had Beat Junkies killing it. We had, uh, yeah, it was amazing. That's beautiful. yeah. Willie came up and, and did an interview and pumped his new record at the time. Yeah, that's so sick, man. Well, this is an obvious question I'm going to make you, but you know, the world's in turmoil. You live in the United States. There's lots of vibes or lots of fights. Um, do, you, do you believe like music can still change the world or help change the vibration to bring it back to balance? Do, do, do we have hope for our, our humanity? Well, uh, you know, if you have the, if you can see the humanity within yourself, then there's always hope. Um, and it's a struggle to just even do that, you know, to, you know, be at peace with yourself. Because I, I think a lot of the problems when, when I feel out of balance, that's when uh, problems outside of me are created, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, when it's the other way, things seem to be oh, pretty cool. Uh, so if you would magnify that, you know, outside of a person into people into community into society into the world um there's a pattern there that so I think it starts with sense. individual healing yeah i think so and it can be done through music if that's your medicine or yeah anything. how you communicate how you wanted to be how you want to be communicated to and you know that inner dialogue you have with yourself it starts there mm -hmm. and and so um it's easy to forget i always do right you know and 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 so you kind of got to reel it back. And did COVID give you a chance to work on your own healing? It did. It did because of the, the divisive nature of dialogue in the world. Like that, that spilled into my close friendships sometimes. Or maybe it didn't and I thought it did. But whatever the case is, how I was perceiving the reality around me Mm -hmm. was however I was perceiving it, whether it was true or not. And it was a direct reflection of A, not seeing people, and B, the, the divisive nature of the narrative that was being promoted through multiple outlets. Right. I there's mean, you put those two together, it's, 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 it's a mess. It's a bomb. Yeah, there's a, a so, vibe out there for sure. So uh, since then, you know, my going back into society has been really, you know, like baby steps, you know, I, 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 this I, is going to be your second. Well, show, I, right? you know, I, I have to be really careful because I, I take care of my mom, okay. you know, so like bringing COVID home to that wasn't going to work. So I was always very vigilant. Right. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, even with the vaccines and, and, you know, there's, you never know the science is always changing and stuff. So, right. But, um, right. but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I'm going out uh, a little bit, starting with small outdoor things. This is the first indoor thing I've done. It's a big space. Uh, we'll see how many people. I brought my mask just in case. You know, things get a little, a little packed in here. But um, it's been great. Yeah, the vibe's been peace. You know, um, people have been real chill. Nice. The, the three events I've been to have been a pleasure. Nice. And do you have any plans for these coming this summer? Um, in LA, uh, hopefully Cinespia, which is back in, in full swing at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. They screen movies at the Hollywood Forever every summer. It's the, one of the best things to do in LA during the summer season. They're opening back up, so they're trying to figure out which, uh, where to put me in that, in that lineup. And then Grand Performances, I don't know when this is airing, but uh, Grand Performances downtown with Ethio Cali, which is an Ethiopian uh, music band from here in LA. Oh, cool. And do, 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 Cancun in December. Cancun in December. I'm actually going to be in Mexico in December, too. Oh, shit. Okay. Mazatlan. I don't know. If, I think uh, that's, it's very far away. Yeah, I think it's Oaxaca. Oh, oh, you're going to Oaxaca? Well, Mas where's Mazatlan? Mazatlan, I thought, was like kind of over here on this coast. Uh, but it's not the Yucatan Peninsula, anyways. Mm. I don't know. I'd have to look at it on the map. But we'll be in the same country at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, doing a, a workshop out there. Um, 
do you, you know, we, the show's going to start soon. There's already people trickling in. Mm -hmm. uh, would you have some final words of wisdom for the people watching this show? Like some, some drop of some knowledge. Follow your heart. Uh, let's see. Find out what it is that makes you happy and don't let it go. Nice. That's a good one. So you gave me a record, uh, you know, when you're warming up here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You signed it. That was oh. awesome. I actually also brought you a gift. What? Uh, remember that painting I was working at the Tipper show? I know you liked it, so I made you a oh, print. Wow. And it embodies the vibe of the DJ that, of you guys playing that night. The super just like good vibes. Oh, yeah, man. Selecta kind of vibration. And it's the message on the back there. Hell right yeah, on. man. Thank you so much, man. Hell yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for like answering this interview. It's been such an honor to Oh to man, have my you. pleasure. My pleasure, yeah. man. I've been I've been following all this stuff and you know, seeing your career just fucking take off, man. And it's and it's great to see your own style that is so unique. Like I said, when I walked in here from far away, I was like, is that a Chris Dyer? Mm -hmm. So I mean to have that identity and, and be successful. You know, that it's, 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 it's incredible. Thank you, man. I, I feel so grateful to be able to do my thing and that people enjoy it and that I can travel the world and make people happy by doing the thing that I love to do. Yeah, yeah it's such a blessing. Cool. I, I'm happy that that works out for you too. And I hope that everybody who watches this show also finds their passion and, and go out there and, you know, live in love and creativity. And Definitely. May that help heal the world. But anyways, thank you once again. And thank you guys for watching this, this show. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, all the good things that helps this show get seen by more people. And I'll see you next time. Blessings. So today I got the great pleasure to be interviewing the legendary surf artist, Drew Brophy. Yeah, I was always looked down upon too, you know, because like, oh, it's not real art, you know, and, but my stuff is like just permeated like, you know, culture for the last 25 years. And I'm like, well, you know, you might not think it's art, but, you know, people grew up on this stuff and it means something to them. Right. Your first skateboard, your first wakeboard, your first boogie board, surfboard, your t-shirts, whatever. Hey, that was my favorite t-shirt growing up. So that makes me feel good. So I don't need the pretentious art galleries or anybody telling me what's good or what's not. So make sure to subscribe, like, and everything else. Big thanks and see you next week. Peace.